Our announcements are on the screen. You've seen those, so I'll highlight some of those again quickly. This week, uh, the blood drive is here on Tuesday, so keep those people in your prayers, and if you are able, please contribute. Um, we have uh, our first Apocrypha Bible study at 6 p.m. on Wednesday night in the room next, right next to the high school. Right next to the high school room. And let's see. Uh, you might notice there, if you have a need for a pastor, uh, there is the contact in the office or in the bulletin here. So um, Beth Myers, Robin Swears are both. Their numbers are listed there. So if you know of anybody that needs a pastor, uh, pastoral care, please contact them and they will get a hold of the people that will be serving you until we are assigned a new pastor July 1st. Um, our March quarters go to the beehives. Um, the meal train um, information is there. Grief share again today at 2.30. And then next Sunday is UMCOR Sunday. You, these envelopes are on the back. Um, that has to do with uh, what's listed in the bulletin there, but it's the administrative costs. So that money that you send to Ukraine and that can go, all of it can go to, to Ukraine or any other thing that happens that we need to uh, help with relief. But this helps with the administrative costs so all the other money can go directly to the relief. So those envelopes are in the back. That will be a collection next Sunday. But if you want to take it home to remember, you can. And then I might also note that on the table in the entryway, um, for our church every Easter, we get these beautiful Easter lilies. And when I talked to the um, gal at the store, she said, I don't know what happened where lilies are being grown, but the price has doubled this year, or almost doubled. So we're going to look at maybe doing something a little bit different to keep the cost down. I have a picture of what it might look like out on the table in the sanctuary, or in the entryway. Um, but you can choose this year. A lily is going to be uh, almost double from what it's been in the past. But you can also choose to uh, order a hyacinth, Daffodils or tulips, those would be in six inch containers like our poinsettias are, and they would be bulbs. You could take those home after Easter and plant those, or you could take them to a friend or leave them at the church and we'll plant them outside, I guess. So th that's in the entryway. The slip looks like this. You can give it in memory of someone or in honor of someone. And then there's blank envelopes to put your stuff in, and you can do that. Uh, for the next few Sundays. So, Deb, the ACH form so that people can set up a direct deposit for the church is now also available on the front page if you go to the sidebar on the front page of the website. Okay. So you can download it there. Did you guys hear that? Okay. Okay. Let's quiet our hearts as we prepare for worship with the prelude and lighting of the candles. And right after that, we will have a Lenten reading called Things of God that will take the place of the call to worship. And this week, we will be focusing on the thorn.
Thorn, noun, a small, sharp, pointed growth on the stem of a plant. If you've ever picked your own roses. Or gone hunting for blackberries in the woods. You know that the simpler definition of a thorn is ouch. Why is it some of the loveliest and sweetest things in nature are protected by painful prickles? If I were a plant, I would tell you that my thorns are to make it more difficult for the friendly neighborhood herbivore to eat me. But I'm not a plant. As far as I can tell, neither are you. We're people. We do not like pain, however it is inflicted. We risk it often. We can tolerate it for a while. We sometimes inflict it upon ourselves and even celebrate it when it's for some greater purpose. Some degree of pain is even guaranteed as part of the process when we enter this world as babies. But we don't like it. And just as when we are a newborn, we scream and cry. We ponder and pontificate about why bad things happen to good people. And those good people we're wondering about? We almost always include ourselves in their number. So our question really is, why me? Why must I feel the poke of a thorn? Why must I suffer because of someone else's bad decision? Why must I bear the pain of a child gone astray? Why must I carry the weight of a parent with dementia? Why does God let this happen to me? No matter how often we ask the question, because the we, truth, because we the, don't really want to hear the answer. Sorry. Because the truth for an, truthful answer is, we don't, we don't know. know. God said to Isaiah, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. As big as the gap is between heaven and earth, the gap between my thoughts and your thoughts is just that big. Bad things happen. And God is not what we sometimes make him. He is not simple. He is not safe. He is not nice. He is love. But love? Well, love can hurt. It certainly hurt him. The intensity of his love for us led to bleeding stripes on his back. The depth of his love for us led him to a painful, stumbling journey through the streets of Jerusalem. The magnitude of his love for us led him to ugly spikes piercing his wrists and ankles. You want to talk about thorns? Maybe like a mother bird who lines her nest with sharp sticks to encourage her fledglings to fly. Maybe like a runner powering through aching feet and cramping muscles to win a race. Maybe like the Apostle Paul's thorns in the flesh that force him to depend on God's overwhelming grace. Maybe God uses the thorns to cause us to thrive. In his wisdom, we can, both, we can use both the things we think are good and the things we shun as bad to shape us. So then, good or bad, I will rejoice in the Lord my God. When the thorns tear at my skin, I will remember that he is faithful. When the difficulties mount, I will remember that he is merciful. When my enemies threaten to devastate me, I will remember that he is mighty. There is no pain that will cause me to turn back. My, my hope, hope is, is in Christ, Christ and, and in him I will rise. Please stand for the opening hymn found in the Faith We Sing book, uh, Song 2172. We are called.
may be seated. Please join me in the opening prayer. Lord, we gather for worship in Lent, a time for reflection and examination. We are grateful for the chance to grow and deepen our faith. We prepare ourselves for the joy of resurrection. Let us put away all within us that needs to die so that we embrace the life that God has given us. Amen. You may maybe remain seated for hymn 408 while the children are coming forward and collecting quarters. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm so glad you're here this morning. The scripture for the children's sermon this morning is, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Those who want to do right more than anything else are happy. God will fully satisfy them. And this is from Matthew 5, verse 9 in the International Children's Bible. Do you ever get hungry? Do you? Me too. Too much. What would you like me to put on this plate for you if you were hungry? Grapes? That's a good choice. Anybody else? Jackson, what would you like on here if you were hungry? Pizza? No. Chicken? All right, that's a good answer. Does anybody ever get thirsty? You, wa you would want milk? That's a good choice. Anybody else? What do you like to drink? Fruit punch and water. Well, that's another, that's another good thing to drink. 
So who provides for you when you get hungry? Who makes sure that you have food on your plate and something to drink in your glasses? Who, no, who provides that for you, though? Mommy does. Yep, mommy does. What about you, Jackson? And daddy? Good, let's give daddy some credit here, too. Daddy, you bet. Mommies and daddies. So, the beatitude for today is, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Just like we fill our stomachs, Jesus wants us to be filled with goodness. In the International Children's Bible, here's what Jesus says. Those who want to do right more than anything are happy, and God will fully satisfy them. Do you know that by collecting quarters, you are being a really good helper? And it's fun to do that, isn't it? Remember, we are going to use those quarters to buy bees and hives and we were going to give those to people so they have a way of earning money so they can eat and also provide for their children. We are doing God's work by collecting quarters for those bees, for the bees, and I hope that makes you happy. Does it make you happy when you're collecting quarters because you know it's going for a very good cause for the beehives? Let's pray. Thank you, God, for providing for our hunger and thirst. May we always remember to be your workers to help other people. Amen. Now, I've got a little treat for you. We seem to be really stocked up with bit of honeys these days. They're good, aren't they? Would you like a couple? There's another one. And there's another one for you. All right. Thank you so much for coming up and showing how pleased we are to help others. Let us come to God in prayer. Holy and loving God, we thank you for this church. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all the good people of the Garner United Methodist Church who are stepping up to help us continue to weather the trials and tribulations that come. We thank you for people who are helping to feed Pastor Mike and Suze. We thank you for Pastor Deb Devine, who is working with our confirmation. We thank you for the people who are planning and carrying out our special things in services for Lent. We thank you for the people who are stepping up to help make sure that pastoral care and other needs are covered. We ask special prayers for Pastor Ron Carlson, who is doing his best to help our church meet our ongoing needs, even while he has other churches and other pastors with difficulties. Lord, you have great compassion for all of us. And in compassion, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to be the savior of the world. Grant us the grace to feel and to lament our share of any evil that made it necessary for him to suffer and die for our salvation. Help us by self-denial, prayer, and meditation to prepare our hearts for a deeper penitence and a better life. 
and give us a true longing to be free from sin through the deliverance won by Jesus Christ. We pray our personal prayers of confession and petition in silence. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will the ushers come forward for our tithes and offerings? Let us pray. God of abundant love, we thank you for your generous gifts as we return a portion of those back to you. Tend the roots of our lives that we may continue to bear much fruit. Tend the shoots of this church that we may be filled with life-giving fruit and haven-like shade for a world hungering for your love and desperate for your protection. In gratitude we pray. Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of the scripture. Our first reading for today is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. This is a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. 
I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us, so that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them did. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and then they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did and 23,000 fell in a single day. We not, must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example. And they were written down to instruct us on whom the end of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing is overtaking you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. You can be seated for the hymn, Change My Heart, O God. Okay, please stand for our second scripture reading, which is found in the book of Luke, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. And that very time there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, that they were worse sinners than the other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in, this vine in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? And he replied, sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. And if it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated for the message. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning wanting to understand your scriptures and to grow to be more like the people you have called us to be. And now may the 
words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and redeemer. Amen. I was raised on a family farm where Saturday mornings usually consisted of shoveling manure from where it was to where my dad wanted it. So when I hit that verse that said, put manure on it, I had to little, dig a little deeper, so to speak. But if you came today expecting a lecture on manure, you're going to be disappointed. I know that Jesus had a very short ministry, so he did not waste time and he didn't waste words. Everything was important. So I had to figure that this comment fit into a much broader picture. In the reading from Corinthians, the Apostle Paul recounts the errors of the Israelites in the wilderness after God had rescued them from slavery in Egypt. They were on their way to the promised land. Remember, a, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of plenty, a land that would be their own, a land chosen specifically for them by God. The journey would not be easy. There would be rules to follow, requirements to get in, but God loved them. And he'd be with them every step of the way. He would assist them with their physical needs, comfort them in their trials, and teach them how to live in a productive society. Now, whenever you read or think about that story, it's a good idea to see the story as an allegory in addition to its being what it is in a historical sense. Because you and I are also on a journey from this world to heaven, from the present age to eternal life. We too will find that the destination has been carefully chosen for us. The journey will be tough at times, but God will be with us every step of the way. He will provide for our physical needs. There will be trials and temptations along the way. And there are also rules to follow, requirements to get in, and expectations for how we are to live. In the wilderness, God provided water from a rock after the Israelites complained. When they griped about food, he provided manna, exactly enough for each day to teach his whiny children to rely completely on him. When they got bored and complained about the manna, he gave them quail to eat. He spelled out expectations for their behavior pretty clearly in two tablets of stone. But still, they rebelled. They found fault with the leadership of Moses. They complained about the heat. They practiced idolatry, committed sexual perversions, and pined for the good old days of slavery in Egypt, of all places. The journey really should not have taken very long, but God made them double back and take a circuitous route for 40 years. Because just as they had got close to the end, they refused to trust God's plan and refused to enter the promised land. So God finally got up with that particular generation and kept them in the desert until the whole lot of them died out. No promised land for them. You might recall that even Moses had angered God once too often, and even he was denied admittance to the promised land, although he did get to glimpse it from the top of a mountain. God had been patient and loving. He had tended to their needs, food and water. Their clothes never wore out. He'd been a visible presence as pillars of cloud and fire in their midst. He parted the water before them. He drowned their enemies. 
still, still. As they got close, they rebelled one final time, and God threw in the towel. Maybe even God can run out of patience. So Paul says to the church at Corinth, be thankful that God has delayed the close of the age so he can offer you and others another chance, another chance to repent and do life God's way. The Christians in Corinth were pretty proud of their church. They were very contented with their spiritual gifts, their experiences, and their worship practices. They focused on God's gift, not so much on the giver. They basked in the free gift of grace rather than living faithfully in response to those gifts. They were pretty much taking God for granted. They are accused of five specific things. Desiring the wrong stuff, idolatry, sexual immorality, testing God, and complaining. Sound familiar? Our particular list, yours and mine, may look a little different, but like the Corinthians, we do often tend to think our current practices are good enough. In the gospel lesson, Jesus is asked about some people who had suffered. Were they bad people? Jesus replies, no, but repent or you will perish. Now, I find that a really odd answer to the question, but he repeats it, so it must be important. Now, the word repent to Jesus had a whole lot more meaning than just saying, sorry about that, God. Repentance refers to individuals and communities turning away from things that violate God's purposes, like idolatry and injustice and exploitation, and turning towards a faithful living centered in worship of the Most High God and in the practices of justice and mutual commitment and other values embodied in love God and love everybody else. Repentance was an essential step in the journey to the promised land, to heaven, to eternal life. Along the journey that Jesus had taken with his disciples, he had constantly admonished them to be responsible stewards, to stay faithful to their call, to acknowledge him as critical to their lives, to live as God provides, to endure the trials that would surely come, and to take the actions necessary to be acceptable and accepted into the apocalyptic realm of God. Otherwise, Jesus cautions, be prepared to pay an apocalyptic price. God, says Paul, God can end the present age any time he wants. He fed us, watered us, looked out for our material needs, and finally, when we still didn't seem able to fully understand his expectations, he sent us the perfect example of how to live faithfully. And still, we rebel. We desire stuff we shouldn't. We make idols looking up to markedly inferior stuff or people. We make light of sexual mores. We put God to the test. And we complain frequently. As with the Israelites, God has to practice tough love. He punished them with a protracted journey, stinging scorpions and poisonous snakes, among other things. But he continued to love them. They continued to push back, to rebel, to disobey. So he gave them the Ten Commandments, not just to show who was in charge, but to help them create an orderly society that would benefit everybody in the community. Still, they acted as if they were 
ignorant of what he wanted or they just didn't care. They tested God's patience and he finally condemned a whole generation of them to being buried in resources. Jesus intercedes for us, but we don't get unlimited chances. How many times does a parent remind a kid to do what they're asked before leveling consequences? And continued disobedience will incur increased consequences. God is loving and kind and generous and patient, but he will not be put to the test any more than a responsible parent would be. We're in the Lenten season, approaching Jesus' final sacrifice after three years of showing us clearly what God expects. Jesus' constant refrain was repent. And if all that meant was to say a quick sorry about that, God, then it was a colossal waste of breath. And Jesus didn't waste time or mince words. We are the trees he had watered and manured and tended. But if we won't bear the fruit we have been pruned to bear, the promised land is off limits. Are we walking the talk? Have we removed the idols in our lives that replace God and prevent us from bearing fruit? Of all the questions we face in our lives, not a single one is more important than where we stand with God. Are we living as those prepared to die? See, It's not that God gave up on the Israelites, decided they'd had enough chances and tossed them to the devil. After all the work he'd put into them, water, food, faithful presence, wise leadership, solid rules, they refused to be pruned into bearing fruit. They chose not to become the persons they could have been, should have been, were destined to be. While God had tried to fit them for the promised land, it was clear they would not be any happier there than they were in the desert. And God doesn't want to give up on us either. But we have free will. We can choose to become the people we were designed to be the persons we should be, the people God has created heaven for. But if we choose not to bear fruit, to respond to the water and air, soil, good manure, and TLC, we won't be any happier in heaven because it was created for fruitful folk. And God will sadly have to let us choose. Be caught up in God's grace, but bear the fruit that is your faithful response. Amen. Will you stand if you're able and join in our hymn, 2153, I'm going to live so God can use me.
receive the benediction. Thou who art over us, thou who art one of us, thou who art, give us pure hearts that we may see you, humble hearts that we may hear you, hearts of love that we may serve you, hearts of faith that we might abide in you. Amen. Let's close with Lord be glorified.